looking at Earth from this vantage point, we have a gravitational field. And from this vantage point, when we look at basically the surface of the planet that we have, as we have right here, this is a constant gravitational field. If we look at it like the picture on my desktop, it looks more like this. Where this is the gravitational field. This one is constant or at least very close to, and we can treat it to be, to be constant, whereas here it is not constant. In terms of gravitational potential energy, we have actually only dealt with one of those situations, the one where we have a constant gravitational field. So the only gravitational potential energy we have figured out so far is this one. PE sub G equals MGH. No, this one needs a constant gravitational field. Today we're going to figure out how to deal with the um, gravitational potential energy when you do not have a constant gravitational field. To draw parallels between what we're doing today and what we did second semester last year and what we're going to do second semester this year. This is looking at it in terms of gravity, a gravitational field. We can also look at this, and this is going to be very similar to the way we deal with an electric field. Notice this would be the electric field that exists between a positive and a negative plate, a constant electric field. This right here would be an electric field that exists around a negative charge. And a lot of the stuff that we're going to do today actually runs, has very good parallels to what you're going to learn when it has, when it has to do with electric fields around uh, positive and negative charges and near large charge plates. So while this is going to be confusing today, it will be hopefully slightly less confusing the next time we go through it because it'll look very similar. Good. The force of gravity is a conservative force. When I say conservative force, you think an equation, an equation that is not on your equation sheet. Zach, what is that equation? Dorfstetter, help him out. Uh, it's actually the, the one that we usually start with is the one that's not an integral, so I want to start with that one. Where we have the force is equal to, Gary, I'm sorry to hear that, conservative force, Rohan, Hamza, it is not, it is not. Don't worry, we're going to let the disease spread across the room here. Loki? Tim? No, this is kind of fun, though. No? <laughs> Miller? <laughs> With respect to position, I'll just put the R. This is the equation that governs any time you have a conservative force. The force is equal to the negative of the derivative of the potential energy associated with that force with respect to position. Specifically, in this case, we're talking about the force of gravity, therefore we're talking about the gravitational potential energy. Rearranging this equation, we get the derivative of the gravitational potential energy equals negative force of gravity with respect to r. We can take the integral of both sides. When we take the integral of both sides, on the left hand side, we get the change in gravitational potential energy is equal to the negative of the integral of the force of gravity with respect to position from position initial to position final. The negative of the integral of the force of gravity with respect to position initial to posi from position initial to position final with respect to position, otherwise known as what? This right here. Tim. 
that would be the integral of acceleration with respect to time. This is the integral of force with respect to position. John? Work. Work. This would be equal to the negative of the work done by the force of gravity. In other words, the work done by the force of gravity is equal to the negative of the change in the gravitational potential energy of an object. If we take an object and it goes from here to here, point, please point in the direction of the force of gravity, point in the direction of the displacement, would you agree that angle is 180 degrees? Therefore, the force of gravity has done negative work, right? And the gravi change in gravitational potential energy is positive or negative? as I go from here to here, positive. positive. So we've increased the gravitational potential energy and the force of gravity has done negative work. That is exactly what you see with this equation. Okay, but we're gonna come back to here. So the change in gravitational potential energy is equal to the negative of the integral from a position initial to position final of the equation for the force of gravity. Well, we have an equation for a force of gravity when we have a non-constant gravitational field, which is exactly what we're trying to deal with here, which is going to be equal to negative big G M1 M2 over R squared with respect to position. Now, the negative goes back to, we're using the vector symbol. So the vector equation, and the vector equation has that negative in it. So we need that negative in here. So we then can take the integral. Let's take the integral here. Change in gravitational potential energy equals, the negatives are gonna cancel. What can I take out from underneath this integral here? What's um, constant with respect to position? The negative g m1 and m2. Notice big G m1 and m2 and the negative is gonna cancel out. So we get big G mass one, mass two, times the integral of from position initial to position final of 1 over r squared with respect to position. So we need to be able to take the integral of 1 over r squared. In order to do that, let me make it a little bit easier on you by illustrating it this way instead, which is uh, 1 over r squared is the same thing as r to the negative 2. So please take the integral of r to the negative 2. R to the negative one over I don't know one. No, negative one. Over negative one. Right. You're just adding one. So you're raising the exponent by one and dividing by that same exponent. So what we get here is from position initial to position final. Let's make this a little bit more clear. So big G M1, M2, mul uh, multiplied over, let's do it this way negative over r from r final to r initial. Actually, I don't want to bring that under. Sorry, I'm going to slightly change this a little bit. So we have big G m1 m2 of negative 1 over r from r initial to r final. In other words, big G m1 m2 multiplied by negative 1 over R final minus negative 1 over R initial. Or the change in gravitational potential energy equals big G M1 M2 over 1 over R initial minus 1 over R final. In order to use gravitational potential energy equals mgh, we had to first identify what, Bill? In order, just going back, big G, I'm sorry, gravitational potential energy equals mgh. In order to use that, we first had to identify the, uh, zero. the zero line. With universal gravitational potential energy, which is what we're deriving here, which is the gravitational potential energy that exists in a non-constant gravitational field, we're lucky because the zero line is predefined. We take uh, gravitational potential energy initial equals zero. This is the zero line. 
right? Gravitational potential energy is equal to zero is located at r initial is equal to infinity. So we set the initial position, the zero line, is infinitely far away from us. What does that do to the change in gravitational potential energy? Travis. Um, instead of one over r initial, then it's just negative r. r. Notice one over r initial becomes one over infinity, which is zero. So notice when we do this, it makes the 1 over r initial go away. And it turns out that the change in gravitational potential energy of an object is equal to negative big G m1 m2 over r final. In other words, the gravitational potential energy of an object is negative big G m1 m2 over r. This is gravitational potential energy in a non-constant gravitational field. <sighs> Jenkins. Can the, the, can the universal gravitational potential energy of an object ever be positive? No. No. Notice, the universal gravitational potential energy of an object can never be positive. Where would that object need to be in order to have positive gravitational potential energy? Okay. It would need to be farther away than infinity. Which is not possible. Right. No, it's not working. So, let's look at this in terms of a graph, because sometimes it's easier to look at it in terms of a graph and understand it better. All right, so we have the gravitational potential energy as a function of position. This would be zero gravitational potential energy would be right there. If we talk about the radius of the Earth, for example, so this would be the gravitational potential energy of, the, of an object and the Earth. So notice that you always have to have two objects in order to have gravitational potential energy. As far as MGH is concerned, we always assumed that the other object was the mass of the Earth. With universal gravitational potential energy, that's no longer the case. But you still need to have two objects. So if one of them is the Earth, the gravitational potential energy is going to look like this. It's going to be a 1 over R, because it's going to be equal to negative big G M1 M2 over R. So it's going to be a 1 over R picture where that's the radius of the Earth. Now, I'm not going to go through it today. It takes a little while to get to the point where we can understand this piece right here. If we assume a constant density of our planet, we're going to end up with a, the gravitational potential energy actually is going to follow a straight line that looks like that. But I'm not going to go through and derive that today. We're going to go through and do that at another time. And this is then negative big G, the mass of the Earth, the mass of the object, divided by the radius of the Earth, which would be the minimum value or the maximum magnitude of the gravitational potential energy. 